بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده تعالى ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله وسلامه عليه أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد Indeed our praise is due to Allah We praise and we beseech and we seek His forgiveness We seek refuge with Allah from the evilness of our own souls And the evilness of our actions and our deeds Whomever Allah has got However Allah has guided there's nothing to mislead them Whoever He has led astray there's no guide for them I publicly bear witness that there is no deity worthy they worship except Allah. He is one that doesn't have any partners. As I bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger, is his worshiper and his final messenger. As for what follows, for indeed the most truthful of all speech is the book of Allah. And the best of guidance is the guidance of Muhammad. The most evils of affairs are novelties in the religion. For all novelties in the religion will lead to innovation. And innovation will lead to misguidance and all misguidance. Ending places, the hellfire. Today we return back to our book, Ta'zimul Ilm, written by Sheikh Sali al Usaymi. And um, the last junction or point that we covered was the third point, Al Ma'qad al Thalith, where it's called Jama'u Himmatin Nafs Alay, which is gathering the determination of the self and seeking after knowledge. This is the one that we're covering, what we covered from the book. And this issue here is very important. And the Shaykh, alhamdulillah, when we had the class the last time, he covered that issue very well in the points that he's brought. But we wanted to bring a bit more clarification to this issue of having ambition upon learning your religion. And that is by quoting some of the statements of our righteous predecessors. And what they had to say in regards to how they sought knowledge and what was the view that they had towards knowledge in their journey. And from amongst those things that it is upon the seeker of knowledge, which is every believer, that he seek knowledge no matter what age he reaches, no matter what status he may achieve in knowledge and in leadership and in the society, that a principle that the ulama of knowledge, the scholars of Islam, has said in regards to seeking knowledge. They has the famous statement that has reached us, Ma'al Mahbara il al Maqbara. With the pen to the grave. Meaning they will write and research and learn and study until death. Until death. Al ilmu min al Mahdi il al Lahdi. And that knowledge is sought from the cradle to the grave. From the cradle to the grave. And this is the methodology that the Salaf, starting with the Prophet and his companions and with the people of knowledge and the students of knowledge from that time up until today. And so we will quote some quotations from amongst the Salaf to bring this point to fruition more so than we already have. And that is one narration that Imam Bukhari, um, radiallahu rahimahullahu ta'ala, what he said before, he says, وَقَدْ تَعَلَّمَ أَصْحَابُ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَمَ فِي كِبْرِ سِنِّهِمْ He said that the companions of the Prophet, رضي الله تعالى عنهم, they sought knowledge in spite of their elder ages. In spite of their elder ages. And Imam Bukhari, this was quoted from him in Fath al-Bari. Explanation of Sahih Bukhari. Also, it was said one time to the great scholar Ibn Mubarak from amongst the three generations. He said, it was said to him, or asked of him, until when knowledge should be sought. He said, he said, until one dies. 
Insha'Allah. And this is a well-known statement from amongst the seller. It was said in another occasion, the same statement to him. And his response to that one, La'alla kalimata alati tanfa'uni lam aktubha ba'du. He said, perhaps I may hear a speech in which will benefit me that I have not written down yet. So in other words, he will continue his response to that same question until when you seek knowledge. He said, perhaps I didn't reach a speech or hear a speech that will read a speech that affect me, will benefit me yet. And what is meant by that type of statement is that when you seek knowledge from the people of knowledge and those who have knowledge, that when you don't limit, when you keep hearing the same issues of the deen interpreted and explained by various people of knowledge, perhaps one scholar will bring a level of clarification that the other one didn't, and it brings greater benefit to you in your life more than what you benefited from what you have heard already. And this is what he meant by this, st is meant by this statement when he says, perhaps there be a word in which has benefited me that I have written that I have not written down yet. And this is a reality of why we seek knowledge because this is in the essence of it, which is looking to find that which will benefit you. And what benefits you is that which will raise ignorance from yourself and that which will bring you closer to Allah and nearness and that which will enhance your relationship with your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala, that which will benefit your soul. So he says, perhaps haven't, that hasn't reached me yet. And so the seller, they, well, that's what they used to do. Always seek in that which would draw them closer to Allah. So this is why knowledge is sought unto the grave. Because no one person can carry all of the knowledge of the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Messenger, وسلم, except the Messenger of Allah. Alayhi salatu wasalam. Al Mansur ibn Mahdi, he said one day to Ma'moon, Ayahsunu bi shaykhi an yata'allam, faqala idha kana al jahlu ya'ibu. He said, Is it something good for the sheikh himself to go learn? Is this something that's good? He says, He said, especially, he said, yes, if knowledge, if ignorance makes him blameworthy and makes him at fault. If ignorance is making him blameworthy and make him be at fault for ta'allamu yahsunu bi, then learning will always be something that is good for him. So in other words, it's not none of us brothers, except that it's something we don't know or some ignorance that may be with us and that we learn so that it may be lifted from us, as we said before. And these are some of the ways the Salaf used to understand this issue. And this is why we bring in these quotations to get a better understanding of this ambition upon and having high determination upon learning knowledge. As Zanuji, rahimahullah, he said from amongst our Salaf, he says, Dakhal al Hassan ibn Ziyad. Wa Hassan ibn Ziyad, yani al-Lu'i, al-Kufi, sahib al-Imam Abi Hanifa, kana muhibban lil-Sunna wa atba'iha, wa kana yakhtalifu ila Zufar, ila Zufar wa Abi Yusuf, fil-Fiqhi, wa tuwufiya sana, arba'a wa mi'atayn, hijri. That as Zanuji, who was Zanuji? Zanuji was a man who his name was al-Hasan ibn Ziyad, al-Lu'lu, or excuse me, Zanuji said al-Hasan ibn Ziyad, and who was Hassan ibn Ziyad? Hassan ibn Ziyad was a man named Hassan ibn Ziyad al-Lu'lu'i, al-Kufi. He was from Kufa, which is in the Iraq area. And he was a person who used to be the companion of Imam Abu Hanifa. And he was a person who was known for his love of the Sunnah and loving the people who follow the Sunnah. And he used to differ with... Zufar and Abu Yusuf in issues of fiqh who were also students of Imam Abu Hanifa and he died the year 204 Hijrah that as Zanuji said about him that Hassan ibn Ziyad rahimahullah had entered had entered he entered into the subject matter of studying fiqh and he didn't start to study this subject matter of fiqh wa huwa ibn except that he had reached the age of 80 years old. 
Senaten. He reached the age of 80 years old. And he never slept in the bed for 40 years. He would stay up all night, every night, and, and study and research. And, and be busy with ibadah. So, we understand from these type of statements is that getting a high status because of knowledge does not hinder a person from benefiting from knowledge. For here you have Musa alayhi salatu was salam. He didn't let his highest status that you can have in his dunya as being a prophet. He didn't let that stop him from going to seek knowledge. It didn't hinder him at his old age. Rather, he left out to meet with the slave of Allah, with the worshiper of Allah, whom Allah had informed him, who had more knowledge than he did, which was Khadir. When Allah informed him, he went straight to him. As we find in the hadith that says Sahih Bukhari under the chapter of Imam Bukhari Sahih, chapter that which has been mentioned in regards to Musa traveling and crossing the ocean to meet Khadir. Allah Ta'ala says in Surah Al-Kahf, the cave, verse 66. Allah Ta'ala says, That Musa والسلام, said to Khadir, Can I follow you so that you can teach me from that which you have learned of guidance and proper directives? He asked him. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu was narrated from him that he had argued, that he had debated and argued with someone named Al-Hur ibn Qais ibn Hisnin al-Fazariyu in relation to the person who was the companion of Musa. He said Ibn Abbas, who a Khadir, meaning the person who he debated with. He said the man was Khadir that this ayah was talking about. So Ibn Ka'ab passed by the two of them and he invited Ibn Abbas. He had invited the two of uh, Ibn Abbas and the person, he invited Ibn Abbas to come with him. فقال, وسلم, he said he asked him, Ibn Abbas, indeed I debated and argued with two companions about this same subject. Who was the person that Musa had asked this question to? That Musa had asked this question to give him direct, can I go with you upon your path so that I can join with you and learn from you? He said, that I asked the Messenger of Allah, I mean, did you hear anything from the Prophet Sallallahu and mention anything about this affair being of this ayah? So the man said, so, the, so Ibn Abbas said, yes, I heard the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying, Bainama Musa fil mala'in, that when Moses was in, a, was, was in a group of people, min bani Israel from the tribe or the septic of, Is, of Israel, ja'ahu rajun, a man came to Moses, faqal, and he said to him, do you know anyone who's more knowledgeable than you? Musa replied, La, I do not. Musa, so Allah revealed to Musa, this is your messenger talking. So Allah revealed to Musa, Moses, Bella, of course there's someone more knowledgeable than you. Abduna Khadir, our worshiper, our slave Khadir. This is what he said. In other words, meaning, of course, there exists someone who's more knowledgeable than you, and that is our slave, Khadir. So soon as this was told to him, he asked Allah, what is the path to go meet with Musa, to go meet with Khadir? And so Allah had made a large fish to be a sign for him. Allah had made a large fish to be a sign for him, meaning a sign for the place where he will find and meet with him. And so, it was said to him that if you lose this big fish, go back. You're going to, you shall meet with Khadir at that place. 
So he went back and traced behind the traces of the fish because the fish, it jumped out the ship. They was going to eat this fish. It jumped out the ship and it, out the boat, I mean, and the, and the fish began to go in the water and the water kept the traces. It never, you know, like when you walk on a desert and you drag a sign, it don't go nowhere, but the water did the same thing, but water usually disappeared. It stayed. So Musa turned around and followed the trace in the water. And as he was told, you will find Khadir there. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him, you shall meet him here. And he will follow the traces of the big fish in the water. Musa Fata. So the young companion that was with Musa who was serving him and following him as was with him had said to Musa he said what you think about us taking shelter at this rock taking shelter at this rock because I forgot the fish and nothing made me forget the fish except for shaitan and as Kora to remember it. For Kala Dharika, Ma Kunna Nebri. For Tedda Ala Athari Hima Kasasa. Yadi be man el Kasasa. Yani el di Kasa I, Ma Zakar who fi Surat al Kaf. Yuxed min Hatha Huna. For Wajada Khadi Rafa Kana min Shatni Hima, El di Kasa Allah fi Kitabi. And so. Musa alayhi salatu salam said to the companion that was with him, he said, that don't, I don't desire to do that. And so the both of them returned and went back and followed the traces of the fish until they found Khadir and they met with him. And their affair at that time was just as Allah narrated the Prophet sallallahu said in the Quran. So here, Hafid ibn Hajar Askalani said about this narration and about this thing about Ibn Abbas in relation to what he said. He says, Hafid ibn Hajar, the statement that Bukhari chapters, chapter what has been mentioned in the traveling of Musa in the ocean to meet with Khadir. He says, this chapter is ma'qood al targhibi fi ihtimal al mashakati fi talib al ilm. He says, this chapter that Imam Bukhari gave his title, because I want you to understand that one of the great understandings that the scholars knew about Imam Bukhari, because people say he was just a muhaddith, he was just a scholar of hadith. But he was not just a scholar of hadith. He was a faqih. He was a jurist. Person who had deep understanding of religion. So much so that the ulama would know his understanding of the hadith based on the chapter. The chapter would be the interpretation of what the hadith is being brought under. So he gave a chapter title and bring narrations, ayats and hadith. The, the meaning of the chapter defines what the hadith is intent and meaning is regarded. So many of the scholars will chapter their books on the same methodology that Bukhari did who came after him because it showed his deep understanding of the religion. So here, Ibn Hajar Askalani, rahimahullah, he's mentioning that Imam Bukhari gave this title under this chapter, that which has been mentioned in the traveling of Musa in the ocean to meet with Khadir. He said this title of this chapter, it it is nothing more than establishing the encouragement to carry the burden of hardship that comes with seeking knowledge. Because hardship is going to come with seeking knowledge. Allah is going to test your sincerity to learn his deen and get closer to him. So he says this shows the importance of carrying the burden of hardship in the path of seeking knowledge. This is worship in and of itself of Allah. As many of the Salaf used to go through severe hardship. That I remember it was narrated by Imam Bawshak Imam Muqbal ibn Hadi al Wadi'i that he used to have a little hole in his wall when he was a student and he would keep a piece of bread in his hole in the wall. And that bread would be so dried out, but this was his sustenance so he could continue to seek knowledge. Going through that hardship. And this is what hardship, if anything, you should make hardship for is upon learning this deen. If anything worthy of one struggling for is to learn the book of Allah and the Sunnah of his messenger. So this is ambition. And then Shaykh Ibn, Ibn Hajjah went on to say about this, this point. He said because that's the thing that envy should be established for and hardship should be 
carried and burdened upon it. لِأَنَّ مُوسَى لَمْ يَمْنَعْهُ بَلُوغُهُ فِي السَّيَادَةِ الْمَحَلِّ الْأَعْلَى مِنْ طَلَبِ الْعِلْمِ وَرَكُوبِ الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ لِأَجْرِ He said because if we look at this story of of Musa, that Musa being a person who reached the highest level of leadership over a people, and he, re- he, re- he reached the highest status in a society, that did not prevent him seeking knowledge and riding on the ocean and tiring and worrying himself, wearing himself out, crossing the ocean by, and going by land for the whole sake of learning knowledge from the likes of Khadir. And that journey was so difficult for them. If you go read that story in the tafsir of Surah Al-Kahf and what Allah tells of that story, it'd be great lessons of what it means to sacrifice. Here Musa reached this high level. He didn't have to do that. But when Allah informed him, informed him there was somebody more knowledgeable than him, and then he embarked upon going to seek knowledge from that person. And then you got us brothers today. You got us brothers today who Allah has made facilitation of learning his deen on the internet. And this is not a primary source of learning. I just heard today the author of the book that we're going through, Sheikh Saleh al usaymi He said, seeking knowledge on the internet has a benefit he said but it's as weak as the spider's web he said he said it's weaker than the house of a spider why because there's some there's some hidden things happening when you learn on the internet you it's easier to cheat it's easier to do things that you shouldn't do. Then there's no effort, no sacrifice, very little that you're doing. So the better calf learning decreases when you learn that way. What? If the person have the ability to get on a plane and go travel and sit with the people of knowledge, then he should. If a person has the ability to walk out of his house and uncomfort himself and come sit in the class, this is better than sitting in your home and listening on the internet. Because this is the case of how knowledge as Allah has established will be successful. As the Salaf used to say, Al-ilmul aziz. Knowledge is honorable, is mighty. Wa yu'azzis, and it gives might. Wa la yu'atika ba'dahu hatta tu'atiyahu kullak. That knowledge don't give you some of it till after you gave it all of you. Wa ba'da an ba'da an tu'atiyaha kullak. Then after you give all of yourself to it, then knowledge may see you worthy of it giving you some of it. Because knowledge of the book of Allah and the sunnah of his messenger, this is something lofty. And knowledge is only supposed to be sought after under the best of character, under the best of manners, under the best of intentions, under the best of dress, under the best of speech. And under the, under the hardest and most striving of attitudes and actions. And this is how the believer views knowledge. So this is why he's narrating this. He says in the hadith that the prophet, he said, Imam Hajj Askalani is still talking. He says in this hadith that we just mentioned from the messenger of Allah. He says in this hadith, Ibn Hajj Askalani, لُزُومَ التَّوَاضُعْ فِي كُلِّ حَالِ to cling to the characteristics of being humbled under every condition and state. For this reason, you find that Moses was very adamant and avarice to go beat with Khadir, upon him be peace, both of them. And he sought seeking knowledge from him. So he could go back and teach it to his people. And yet to adabu be admin so so that they may take on the mannerisms that he may achieve from learning from Qadir. And this is also a notification and attention being brought for every person who wants to praise themselves and feel like they have arrived. And yes, look at Maslakat that they must traverse upon the behavior of humility and humbleness. That's the only way knowledge comes. Ilm comes to you, real knowledge. Through humility and humbleness. You cannot learn knowledge from a sheikh until you humble yourself to that sheikh. And sit at the feet of that sheikh. And respect that sheikh. So much so the Salaf used to say, Oh Allah, hide the faults of my sheikh so I can benefit from his knowledge. That's how knowledge is sought, brothers. Not the way we go to school 
and disrespect the teachers and and so on and so forth but rather knowledge is sought with humility as he's mentioning look how musa humbled himself and he's a prophet and messenger the scholars there's no doubt about moses being of the greatest of prophet messengers and prophets this debate about Khadir whether he was a prophet or not and yet let's say if he wasn't a prophet because i personally go with the scholars that say he's not or he wasn't a prophet let's say if he wasn't a prophet musa humbled himself and put himself under him so that he could benefit from his knowledge because you cannot benefit from knowledge to those you don't humble yourself to and honor and revere as the salaf used to say so what conglomerates what is intended here from what was mentioned from the statement of Imam Bukhari under that chapter is that the companions of the Prophet when he said in the first statement we quoted of Imam Bukhari that the companions of the Prophet they learned knowledge in old age they were older men Uthman ibn Affan when he accepted Islam he was in his 50s and his 60s when he became the rulers of the Muslims he was in his 80s and Uthman memorized the whole Quran Rather, he became a source for the Quran. So, let us understand that reality. For this statement, this is a concise and beautiful statement of Imam Bukhari that he's saying about the companions. That the companions learned in their older ages. This is a concise statement from Abi Abdullah al-Bukhari. Rahimahullah that indicates and directs to the tamam al fiqhihi, the perfect understanding that he had and the perfect awareness that Imam Bukhari had. And it is not suitable for no one and not permissible for no one to abandon knowledge and seek an understanding of this religion because of his old age. That's nonsense. Since that did not hinder the companions of the Prophet. That they will be in regards to knowledge, bil mahal ladi yarifu kulu muslim. That the status and position they became a place of coming to get knowledge. The companions of the Prophet, they were old men. In spite of the fact Ibn Abbas became who he became, he still wasn't as great as Abu Bakr and Umar, Uthman and Ali. Ali was young when he accepted Islam, but Abu Bakr, Uthman, Ali, I mean Uthman, Umar. These were old men. The message, there's no one to ever have the knowledge of Abu Bakr. Or the likes of Umar ibn Khattab. As some of the Salafists said, which we're going to quote, that when Uthman had died, when Umar, Umar ibn Khattab died, they say a great deal of knowledge died with Umar. The one whom the Messenger of Allah said, after me, follow Umar ibn Khattab. Abu Bakr and Umar. Follow after me, Abu Bakr and Umar. Abu Khaythama. No, excuse me. The Sheikh says Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and other than them, other than them, men akabir ulama sahaba from the great major scholars of the companions. Ma aslamu illa wa hum kibar. None of them accepted Islam except they were old men. But they embarked upon the Messenger of Allah. And they drank from his ocean of knowledge. Until they fulfilled the objective of obtaining that knowledge to the point they was able to convey it in the best way that knowledge can be conveyed. The men, these old men, these grown men. And they reached the, the end points of knowledge that no one who came after them can ever surpass them. And Ibn Hajj Askalani said, May Allah be pleased with all of them. And that's the end quote of Ibn Hajj Askalani. Abu Khaythama, Rahimahullah, he had narrated with a chain that reached the Tabi'i Masruq. May Allah have mercy upon him. He said, Masruq, Jalastu Ashab Rasulullah. He said, I sat with the companions of the Messenger of Allah. Fakanu kal ikhadi yarwir raqibah. وَالْإِخَاذِ يَرْوِ الرَّاكِبَيْنِ وَالْإِخَاذِ يَرْوِ الْعَشَرَةَ وَالْإِخَاذِ لَوْ نَزَلَ بِهِ أَهْلِ الْأَرْضِ لَأَصْدَرَهُمْ 
wa inna abdullahi min tilkal ikhad. It's a beautiful Arabic statement, mashallah. He says that I, Masruq, sat with the companions of the Messenger of Allah, and all of them were like a ikhad. The ikhad. An ikhad, brothers and sisters in Islam, is a place where water be, be collected at. Where water can be collected at. And Masruq is the, describing the companions of the Prophet as being like this thing called ikhad, the place where water can be gathered at. And some, and he went on to mention, an ikhad, or I guess we can say like a small river, or a contain, a place, thing that can hold a lot, hold on water. He said, and one ikhad can be enough to fulfill the contain a container of water that's filled up. This type of container is big enough to fit to, to give drink to two riders. And it's enough to give drink to ten. Rather, it's enough that if the people of the earth was to come down to an ikhad, it will be able to initiate giving them water to drink. He says, This is the example of Abdullah. Abdullah ibn Abbas. He said that's the example of what he was. He was a container of knowledge, endless benefit. You get the point? And so here we understand as Sheikh al-Bani says about this, ikhad bi wazni kitab. He says a ikhad is equivalent to a book. Right? Like the size of, of like was equivalent to a book. A book can have endless benefit in it. And an ikhad, therefore, is a place where water is collected and gathered at. And Abdullah that he's referring to, excuse me, not Ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And he said he was like that ikhad. He, his, he never ceased benefiting from the likes of him. Likewise, Khaythuma, he also narrated on authority of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the companion of the Prophet, radiallahu anhu, that he said, لو أن علم عمر بن خطاف radiallahu الله تعالى عنه وضع في كفة كفة الميزان لو وضع علم أهل الأرض في كفة لرجح علم عمر بن الخطاب He says and this is the companion Ibn Mas'ud who was a major scholar amongst the companions he said about Umar ibn al-Khattab he says that if the knowledge of Umar ibn al-Khattab was to be placed on one side of a scale a weighing scale one of the hands of the scales and was placed the knowledge of the people of the earth in the other side of the scale, truly the knowledge of Umar bin Khattab will outweigh the knowledge of the people of the earth. And Al-Albani said this chain of this hadith is, is sahih. Abdullah ibn Abbas, I mean Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he says, Inni la ahsabu Umar qad dhahab bi tis'ati a'shar al-ilm. He said that I consider that Umar, when he died, left with him nine-tenths of knowledge. What is death? This is a tremendous statement to me. Because the knowledge, and this is go back to what? This go back to what? We insist the end quote that we want to quote under this subject matter for, on um, relation to this fourth or third ma'qad or point or junction that this statement that a non-tenths of knowledge died with Umar something we need to understand and relate what does that mean what do they mean that non-tenths of knowledge died? because we hear this about many scholars that many scholars have died a lot of knowledge went with that scholar that don't exist no more what do y'all think that mean? Before I even say that, what do y'all think that statement mean? What died with him? What do y'all think? I want to get a response from y'all. Bismillah from somebody. What do you think that mean? Come on, somebody got to have something. To Tafadda. He said their ability to spread the knowledge. Okay, y yes. He says he thinks the character that may come with the knowledge that he has. Mashallah. Anybody else? The fuck, but he said one next, a third brother said the correct understanding and the wisdom. All of you are not incorrect. 
But 10,000 times we ask questions like this, the people give response around it or that which is a part of it. I'm looking for a more comprehensive response that would include all of what y'all said. What we need to understand, knowledge must come with practice. And when a person teach knowledge, he's teaching what he or she practice. Knowledge is never something, just information that you got in your head. The self was not like that. Rather, they had knowledge and they practiced the knowledge and called to what they knew and practiced. So the better he, be, he, he becomes at that and conveying knowledge because of how much he live it. The one who have information ain't like the one who has the information and live that information. He understands the intricacies of that information. He, can, he knows the minute details and benefits and harm that exist in that information, which one who just walking around with info in his head will never be able to understand and will never be able to know. So when this person who reached these high level of knowledge, knowledge goes with them because these people reach so high level of knowledge, they're able to speak little and it has much benefit. And at the helm of them in doing it was the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it's important for us to understand that reality is that true people of knowledge, these are individuals who live that knowledge. And when we look at them, they're, they're not just carrying information, they're carrying how to practice that information, how to live that information. This is why when we read about the books of the Salaf, you ever pay attention, when we look at Hadith, do you see, a, most of the, you see more narrations from the likes of Ibn Abbas or more narrations from the likes of Umar ibn Khattab and Abu Bakr and Uthman? You see more narrations from Ibn Abbas. Does that mean Ibn Abbas was more knowledgeable than, than them? Why do you think we see less narrations from these elder companions who are more knowledgeable? And yet many of the narrations we get from who? Who narrated the most Hadith? Abu Huraira. Was Abu Hurairah more knowledgeable than Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali? But yet we got least narr less narrations from them. We, Abu Abd ibn Abbas, why? Because knowledge began to be left off in application and living it during the time of the likes of Ibn Abbas. So it required them to speak more and educate more and clarify more. When the time of Abu Bakr and Umar, everybody's practicing, so he need to speak very little. They're on another level of application and comprehension of the deen. He just got to say a little and the people get it because they're living it. When a lot of generations, he got to break it down and go through this and go through that. We didn't have this during the time of the earlier companions. So understand that reality. And that brings us to the next ma'qid that the sheikh, that we hopefully have enough time to cover. This next ma'qid is ma'qid al-rabi' which is the fourth junction which is the fourth junction and this fourth junction brothers is sarf al himmati fihi ila ilm al qur'ani wa sunnah which is expending effort in seeking the knowledge of the quran and sunnah which we kind of talked about putting out a serious effort to learn the book of allah and the sunnah of his prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam okay this ma'qid is very important to understand because the author says inna kulla ilman or with this definition of this subject matter Sheikh himself the author of the book Salih al usaymi he says to dispose or expending or exposing effort or dispose of your effort in seeking knowledge of the Quran and Sunnah putting that sincere effort out he says this means this is actually Sheikh Usali Usaymi's interpretation of his title. He says, the author of the book, he says, this title means that the worshiper, the slave of Allah, he directs his ambition and his efforts towards seeking a higher level of knowledge, a higher level, not to bring, raise himself. In knowledge and practice to raise himself how many of us think about this reality we get information we still be the same stinky people we were before we received it so having this ambition in regards to the knowledge to seeking more knowledge from the Quran and Sunnah and the Sheikh he says inna kulla ilman nafi'in 
Muradduhu ila kalam ila That indeed every benef form of beneficial knowledge Returns back to the speech of Allah Wa kalami rasul Into the speech of his messenger Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Pay attention to this This is very paramount Because this is directly connected to our aqidah He says Wa baqil ulum He says the rest of the sciences of the deen Or any sciences Any science Is imma khadimun lahuma they are either sciences that are giving service to the book of Allah, and the, to the speech of Allah, and the speech of His Messenger, for you so it's to be taken from. La yatahakku bihi khidma. La yatahakku bihi khidma. Aw ajnabiyun anhuma, fala yadurru jahlabi. Repeat that again. Surely all beneficial knowledge goes back to the speech of Allah and the speech of His Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. While the remainder of knowledge. That is out there is either in its service In the service of the book and the sunnah So whatever serves it Deserves to be taken Or it is going to be something that's alien to it The kitab and sunnah And being ignorant is this kind of knowledge That is harmless Meaning being ignorant of that information In other words what he's saying Any other sciences in the sciences of Islam its objective is to aid the Quran and the Sunnah. The science of Hadith is to make show you that the Hadith is authentic, to aid authenticating the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of His Messenger. The science of Usul al Fiqh, the principles that are abstracted, is to make easy the comprehension of the Book of Allah, is serving the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of His Messenger. Like this. So these things that has come, they're going to be one of two things because who is coming with these explaining these sciences are the scholars of Islam. And what every scholar of Islam is victim of? Khata or sawab. Making mistakes and being correct. So when he, because of that, it is understood when he says, if it's meant the science is being given to serve the religion and is bringing clarity like this to the religion, then it deserves to be taken. But not unequivocally like it's the Quran and like it's the Sunnah. Mean, so he said, therefore he says, or it is going to be alien to it. And that may be the mistake the Sheikh may make in clarifying something. He may make his human. He may make an error in, his, in trying to bring close what is far for the people to understand and make it easy for them. He might make a mistake. He says, and that is the thing. Is a form of being ignorant, and that kind of ignorance is knowledge that don't harm you not to know it. So in spite of the fact the scholars are coming, we magnify the scholars and the people of knowledge and those that come to clarify the truth for us. We don't give them the same status as the book of Allah and the sunnah of his messenger. Unwit, which is unmistake, no mistakes in it. No, it's perfect. But the one who convey it is not perfect. So we always be ready to accept and never magnify a person to that extent. But rather we use him as a tool to get to the book of Allah and the sunnah of his messenger because he has it. But no doubt his accuracy is going to be far more than his error and his mistakes. And so the Shaykh Hafidullah is saying this. He says, Wa ilal Qur'ani wa sunnah. He says, and to the Quran and to the Sunnah is the end of all knowledge that knowledge returns to. Every form of knowledge must return back to the Sunnah, the book of the Sunnah. What does that mean? That means math, science, chemistry, any knowledge must go back to the book of Allah and the Sunnah's message. What does that mean? It can't oppose it. If it's saying something that's in opposition to what Allah is saying, we throw it where? Up against the wall. It ain't beneficial knowledge. That's what's being applied here. So here's in this statement of the author is some aqidah. We magnify the book of Allah and the sunnah of his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And then he says, he quotes the statement of Allah Ta'ala, فَاسْتَمْسِكْ بِالَّذِي أُوحِيَ إِلَيْكْ إِنَّكَ عَلَى صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ In Surah Al-Zukhruf, verse 43. Allah Ta'ala says in Surah Al-Zukhruf, the adornments, verse 34, I mean 43. Allah Ta'ala says, and cling, talking to his prophet and the believers, cling to that which has been revealed to you, Muhammad. Cling firmly, grasp firmly to that which has been revealed to you. Indeed, you are upon the straight path. 
And this is our attitude. The Shaykh says, Hal uhiya ila Abi Qasim Shay'un siwa al Qur'ani wa Sunnah. And the Shaykh says, Was it revealed to Abu Qasim, which is the nickname of the Prophet, because he had a son named Qasim, was revealed to Qasim other than that which is other than the Quran and the Sunnah? And whoever makes his knowledge be the Quran and the Sunnah, then he is a follower and not an innovator. And he will obtain from knowledge the most fulfilling of that knowledge. He will obtain from knowledge the most fulfilling and complete of that knowledge. And this is important to understand because you got people today, and I was a student in the University of Azhar. And we had to study the madhahab, the four madhahabs, right? And unfortunately, many of the books that was used to teach the madhahab, it constantly, for evidence, was always the statements of those scholars. Sheikh said this, and this sheikh said this, and this sheikh said this. Very little you saw, qala Allahu, qala rasuluhu. Very seldom did we see in those books, Allah said his prophet said. So what became of this, because these people was upon the aqidah of the asha'ira who put the intellect before the text. If you quote to these people, the messenger of Allah, they say, well, what was Sheikh Abu Hanifa said about that hadith? What's his position? What his position? Not what the messenger of Allah said, and we can co compare the statement of this Sheikh to the prophet's statement, because they magnified the scholars above the text. So here, he, the author is saying, uh, the expending one's effort towards Knowledge of the Quran and Sunnah is the true magnification. In other words, he's saying magnify the Quran and the Sunnah. This is important, brothers. Not people, not scholars. They magnify, but because of what they convey of the Kitab and Sunnah. And the better he added doing that, the more we magnify them. And the less he do that, the less we magnify him. And we never place his speech as evidence, but rather as for bringing the clarity to the evidence. You get it? And then he says, قال ابن مسعود that ابن مسعود رضي الله تعالى عنه he said, هل ابن مسعود is من أراد العلم فليثول القرآن فإن فيه علم الأولين والآخرين ومعنى يثول يعني فليبحث ابن مسعود said whoever wants knowledge then let him do detailed research in the Qur'an. For indeed in it is the knowledge of the first and last generations. The first and last of generations. Masruq, rahimahullah, he said, مَا نَسْأَلُ أَصْحَابِ مُحَمَدٍ عَنْ شَيْءٍ إِلَّا عِلْمُهُ فِي الْقُرْآنِ إِلَّا أَنَّ عِلْمَنَا يَقْصُرُ عَنْهُ He said that we did not we did not ask the companions of Muhammad about anything, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, except the knowledge of it was already in the Quran. Except that our knowledge fell short from knowing the Quran. You get it? It has been attributed to Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu that he said this line of poetry. Jamiu al ilmi fil Qurani, lakin taqasar anhu, walakin taqasar anhu afhamu al rijali. He says that all of knowledge is in the Quran, but the understanding of men fell short. So, what does that mean? The human beings who have understanding are going to fall short, and the less amount of mistakes is going to be defined on how well he has knowledge of the Quran. The less his mistakes are going to be. And who had the least mistakes was the companions of the Prophet Radiallahu He says how excellent is the statement of Iyad al yahsubi in his book Al Ilma. He said Al Ilmu fi Aslaini La Yadu Huma Illa al Mudillu an it tariqi la hibi Yani Wadihi. Kat usni that antabi in ansahibi he says in the statement, Iyad al Yahsubi, in his book Al Ilma, or the translation of it is, How beautiful is the statement of Iyad? He says, Knowledge is only found in two sources. 
Knowledge is only found in two sources. None goes beyond them except the one who is misled from the lighted path. The knowledge of the book and the knowledge of the narrations. That's where they that were transmitted from the tabi'i and the companions. SubhanAllah. Beautiful, ain't it? Meaning a tabi'i, one of the followers of the companions. These are the people who conveyed the narrations to us. That's knowledge. Everything else is supportive and bring clarification. Understand it. So he want to focus. This is one of the most important things about magnifying knowledge. Is magnifying the Quran and the Sunnah. Learn the Quran and the Sunnah, man. He says, <laughs> He says, The highest ambition is in seeking knowledge. Just as Ibn Qayyim al rahimahullah says in the famous book Al Fawa'id, Talabu ilm al kitabi wa sunna wal fahmu an illahi wa rasuli, nafs al murad, ilm al hudud al munazzal. He says in this statement, Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyah, that seeking knowledge of the Quran and Sunnah, or seeking of knowledge in the Quran and Sunnah, and understanding from Allah and His Messenger is it's in and it of itself is the objective and knowledge of the laws and limit of what has been revealed. Understanding the laws and limits of what has come down and been revealed. That's the statement of Ibn Qayyim. For this was the knowledge of the Salaf. Alayhim rahmatullah. This was the knowledge of the predecessors. May Allah have mercy upon them. Then after them, speech in what was not beneficial began to increase. So knowledge is found more in the predecessors, while speech is more among those who came after them. You get that? Learn who your salaf were. Learn who your salaf were. Learn what they said. Their speech was very little. For this reason, Ibn Qayyim mentions in Madari Jasali King, we're gonna stop in two minutes. He says, That the Salaf, Ibn Qayyim mentions that indeed the speech of the earlier generations, it was very little. But it had an abundance of blessings in it. He said the speech of the latter generation is many. But it had very little benefit in it. And this is the truth, man. Don't ever think other than this reality. Don't ever think other than this reality. And now we close the class with this point of Allah allowed me to get this out. The sciences of Islam, all of them are praiseworthy. And from the sciences of Islam is that which have ranks and degrees and status. Some above, uh, they are one above the other. Ibn Qudama, he says, That the sciences of Islam, all of them are praiseworthy. And he says that the knowledge categorized into fundamentals. Branched off things from those fundamental fundamental principles, things that branch off from it, and that which must be proceed of their knowledge, and that which completes the knowledge. That's legislate. Those are the legislative sciences of Islam, comprised of these four things: fundamental principles, branched off principles. Secondly, muqaddimat, that which must proceed before it, and that which comes to perfect it and complete it. He says, al usulu. The foundations of knowledge is the book of Allah Ta'ala and the sunnah of his messenger wa ijma' al-ummah, the consensus of the ummah wa athar sahaba and the narrations of the companions. That is the foundation of Islamic legislative knowledge. Secondly, the branched off affairs of the foundation is ma that which is understood from those principles of the foundation we just mentioned of meanings. That brings notice and attention to the intellect until the point is understood the wording that comes and what is to be abstracted from it just as what is understood in the statement of the prophet la yaqdil qadi wa huwa ghadban 
that the judge does not make a judgment while he's angry. What's understood from it, he also don't make judgment when he's hungry. You get it? The muqaddimat, the things that must proceed before knowledge, those are the things that must flow, the natural flow for you to be able to abstract knowledge, which is knowing, having the tools that's needed to be able to look into the text and abstract from it. And that is having knowledge of Arabic grammar, having knowledge of the Arabic language. For indeed, the, these two things are tools for the knowledge of the book of Allah and the sunnah of his messenger. The last and fourth category of the things that complete knowledge, he calls it, al-mutammimat. They are having knowledge of the various forms of recitation of the Qur'an, learning tajweed, having knowledge of the names of the men in the chains of hadith, knowing their trustworthiness and their conditions and state when they conveyed it. For this are the basis of the legislation of not legislative knowledge of Islam and all of it is praiseworthy which goes back to what we said in the beginning and this is what I had to present for today hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barik ala nabiyyana muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen tafaddu with the adhan